for the Nordics at the Scottish Government. Um, and I'll also introduce our panellists for today. Uh, I'm joined by two very experienced leaders in this field. Um, Mr. David Minton, Director of the Northern and Western Regional Assembly in Ireland, and Mr. Hilary Havukainen, Project Manager on East and North Finland Industrial Transition at the Regional Council of Lapland in Finland. Um, so thank you both for taking time to join us today. Uh, really pleased you're able to join the session um, and hopefully share some of your expertise and knowledge with us. Um, in terms of the agenda for today's session, um, we'll start with some introductory presentations um, taken by our two speakers, uh, followed by some general discussion and follow-up on the presentations, and then to a bit of a Q&A session, um, which, as Mikhail outlined, um, just raise your hands or put some questions in the chat. Um, so yeah, just follow those instructions when the time comes to participate. Um, so we'll then look to kind of summarise um, towards the end, round up our conclusions, um, and here's some final thoughts from our speakers around 10 minutes before the end um, to give us plenty of time to rejoin uh, the plenary session on time. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I'll hand over first of all to David uh, to take us through his presentation, uh, which will hear about the challenges from a regional perspective and his experience being part of an MPA program area. So over to you, David. Uh, good afternoon, Leslie. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to Michaela. Will I try and share my screen? You are. Maybe I have it. Yeah, that's okay. Out. I think that's you. Yeah, I got it. I think. Yeah. Uh, okay. If, um, Folks, good afternoon. Just to welcome everybody. And as Leslie says, my, my name is David Mitchell. Um, I'm extremely fortunate to be the director for the Northern and Western Regional Assembly in Ireland. Um, I'm joined today by my colleague, uh, Brendan Mooney, uh, who's on the call. And I, I, I think I've seen a few colleagues from around the region, particular colleagues in, in, in Ernact. I think Jose Manuel is, is, is here and uh, Danny O'Toole in Mayo County Council. Um, and there may, there may be a few others and, and hopefully I suppose my presentation can act more as a, as a discussion point um, than anything else. Uh, I, I think just to correct one thing, I, I always hate being um, labelled an, an expert or a leader in anything because you're, 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 only, you're only going to disappoint. So um, I, I think the best I can do is try and share our experience in, I suppose, in search of coherence to smart specialisation in Ireland. And Michaela had asked me just to kind of look at, I suppose, maybe ways where... Um, we can add to the discussion, I suppose, but share, I suppose, our knowledge and our expertise, which I'm going to say we're, we're probably lagging behind, but I think most importantly is, I suppose, the relationships that we have with our, with our colleagues across the Arctic and the Northern Periphery and area in, in, in extracting knowledge from them over the last couple of years in pursuit of smart specialization. So I thought the best way to do this was to, was, I suppose, in, in expressing my real, disappointment in not being in, in Finland today was to try and do this by uh, little analogies of Santa Claus. So I hope everybody can see the screen and I suppose I'm going to take you through a very quick timeline and, and basically if you can see on the top left hand side of my screen anyway we've got a fat Santa trying to get into um, trying to get into a chimney. Now this this for us probably reflects probably 2013, 2014 when I suppose Irish national policy was kind of pulled in the direction of smart specialization by, um, by Europe, in, in, I suppose, in, to support the S3 platform. And I suppose, albeit we were reluctant, it was, as, as most of you know, it was a condition to access structural funds that Ireland would, would adopt a smart specialization strategy. So the, the second picture here really, I suppose, reflects maybe our, our view on, I suppose, the current national smart specialization strategy which is i suppose really it's it, it was done uh, i suppose not not in a in a in a huge respect in relation to a kind of a bottom up and top down partnership but much more so a national um response to a request by the european commission so for us it was kind of santa claus looking in the window at it kind of understanding it and, and starting to kind of dip the toe in smart specialization 
Now we have some really excellent leaders and agencies and people involved in smart specialization um, at a national level. And I suppose, look, we can, you know, we can pull out stats all day and every country has them. But if you look at Ireland, for example, Ireland ranks at the moment, you know, 11th in the global scientific ranking. You know, when you look at things like nanotechnology, we're second, uh, again, second in the likes of animal and dairy science, second in immunology, fourth in agricultural science. So we can't really... Um, uh, debate the fact that you know Ireland has pursued elements of a smart specialization strategy but it, it hasn't really focused at all at a sub-national level and that's kind of what, where I wanted to facilitate this discussion over five or ten minutes so the Santa who's kind of fallen through the chimney a little bit drunk with the presence he's kind of delivered um, but he hasn't kind of delivered for all and I suppose this was recognized by Irish government policymakers at a, at, a, at a national level, but also at a regional local level. And I suppose in order to grapple with, I suppose, the elements of smart specialization strategy, I suppose the, 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 the policy itself was nearly seen in a vacuum back in 2014. And as all of the actual experts here know, I suppose it, you can't pursue as a vertical smart specialization strategy and of course or, or you know and smart specialization is not applied in kind of linear steps of course it needs to be um, much more non-linear it needs to you know encourage the likes of convergence across industries um, it needs to foster collaboration and, 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 and cooperation so you know I, I think where we are now at the moment is the kind of the drunk Santa who's got into the into the game of smart specialization but now we're really looking at trying to address how we apply it at a regional level. And that was in response, I suppose, to I suppose Ireland recognizing that we were exposed to a lot of kind of international and national trends around urbanization, digitization, globalization. And that had created a lot of problems in Ireland. Um, and in 2018, the, the government published its national planning framework, which was a reimagination of our planning and economic development system in Ireland which was much more of a focus on kind of sub-national level. So some of the challenges that we had, for example, in included the likes of sprawling uh, residential growth around our cities and towns. Um, you know, even our cities being stagnating, our inner, inner city areas. Uh, and then the cities themselves, who are supposed to be the engines of growth with this, you know, particularly European level, this urban-led regional development, our cities really weren't thriving. They weren't growing at the speed that we needed to. Um, and, and I suppose particularly for any of those more familiar with Ireland, Dublin, Dublin is obviously on our east coast. And what we were seeing was an ongoing shift in population, particularly from the west and, and the northern parts of Ireland to the east, for obviously for relocation, for job opportunities, career opportunities. But that was having huge impacts then on our environment. It was having huge implications on our health system, increasing distance between where people work and live. The average, the average person in, in Ireland commutes about an hour and 10 minutes every day, um, which you know, has huge, huge health and environmental implications. And then for us in the northern and western region, which is the lightly blue shaded and dark shaded blue area, this is where I suppose we share the similar characteristics, particularly with our colleagues across the northern periphery area. So um, we were tasked at a regional level to develop a regional spatial and economic strategy, which essentially was focusing on th uh, focusing very much on an economic and enterprise strategy, but, but really focusing on this idea of compact growth and urban-led regional development. And that allowed us to develop the first metropolitan strategy. So of course, if we were all sitting in, in Ulu in Finland, I'd be able to use Ulu as a kind of an example of a kind of peripheral area with an urban location. The west and the northwest of Ireland is very similar to that type of um, that type of landscape. But of course, you know, we, we, we are equipped with, I suppose, high level, um, third level education in the likes of Na University College Galway, which of course, you know, operates in the top one percent of global universities. Um, and then you look around industry. We have we have industry in location in the region here, like the likes of brands like Coca Cola. Um, we have the likes of Allergan. Um, which uh, I keep joking, my colleague Brendan Mooney, it's why we all look so good because 100% of the world's uh, Botox is produced in the west and the northwest of Ireland. Um, and, then, and then, of course, we have a, we, we, we have we were nominated as the 2018 European Entrepreneurial Region, recognizing, I suppose, a higher percentage of smaller, medium sized enterprises. But we had a huge problem at a, at a sub national level in the convergence of both policy and investment to kind of stimulate, I suppose, certain key growth sectors. Um, so, and it, 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 many, many of our colleagues will be familiar with this type of kind of 
visual mapping um, of your own region. You can apply it to most of the countries who participate in the NPA. When you look at, I suppose, the traditional um, business and competitiveness infrastructure that's provided to sustain a region and make it resilient. If you look at the motorway network in Ireland, the west and the northwest is, is meekly provided. Some parts of our region and our towns and villages are over three hours away from the nearest motorway network. When we look at our electrical grid network, um, which, which of course is, is critical for the likes of you know, the data industry, uh, for you know, participating in Industry 4.0, again, you know, the region's not served. And this can be used across rail industry, our ports and harbours. When you look at our tourism industry and the scale of, of overseas and, and internal domestic visitors, again, the region is lagging. And uh, that has resulted in, the re I suppose, the region now from a European perspective being, being reclassified from a developed region back to a region in transition. So for the period of 21-27, the region has now slipped back in a competitiveness, um, on its competitiveness level. So we started to ask the question, why and what was that going to be served with? So we, we took the last 11 years of, of, of European and Irish investment into the region and we looked at elements like um, regional local roads, investment in research and development, health infrastructure, airport infrastructure, third level infrastructure. And out of, out of every eight of the 11 years and all of those elements, the region had the lowest contribution under any of those, which, was, which has only led to the European Commission writing in its country specific report in 2020 that Ireland has the highest levels of regional inequality in, amongst European member states. It also flagged that COVID-19 has, will have, or will exacerbate the divide between the regions in the east, the south, and the northern and western regions. So we start to ask ourselves, okay, how, how do we address this at a level? So we started looking at, I suppose, where we would see particularly in, in, in Ireland, we wouldn't have traditionally looked north towards the, the Arctic, Scandinavian countries, and, and the northern periphery countries. But in the last five years, because of our relationships with the NPA and the <coughs> critical linkages that we've developed through the likes of the you know, successful local partnerships, again, the people like the Airnax of this world, the Westpix that we have in the region, the likes of the Mayo County Council who are taking, you know, taking risks to start looking above and beyond the kind of traditional relationships, getting involved in projects like we heard earlier on, the Emmergreen project, um, getting involved in the likes of the Stratus project, again, with Mayo County Council, real cutting edge piece of the work. You know, we started to look at, okay, you know, who are the leaders in the MPA program? Who are the ones who are doing the, the smart specialization at a very radical um, pace? So we started the conversation looking at, I would say the likes of Alistair Campbell in Scot with the Scottish innovation policy. We reviewed the Scottish innovation policy um, with a particular focus on the likes of the highlands and the islands. You know, they've done some really good work there on, on their clusters, particular cross cluster um, work that was, that was done in 2018, 19, I think it was. Um, and then it got us to a stage where I suppose the, the members and the elected members of the regional assembly started to gravitate into the space of, okay, how do we, how do we com com compose our own smart specialization in a policy context of maybe our, the national government being reluctant to look sub-nationally? And I, I always remember back in 2017 being in a discussion when we were developing a national planning framework, looking at our metropolitan areas, looking at our sub-regional planning um, systems, that there's a real reluctance at a central level to look beyond um, uh, in, in relation to doing these types of strategies. So um, I suppose to, to, to conclude, the, the European, so sorry, so, uh, two, two elements to conclude. Earlier this year, the, the Regional Assembly pushed with um, the European Commission for a review of Ireland's smart specialisation strategy. And a, co a colleague um, who was appointed um, a Scottish or a, a Belgian Bay, Brussels based uh, Scottish national, a woman called Alison Hunter, did a review of Ireland's smart specialisation strategy and found some really, really you know, interesting bottlenecks and, and maybe evidence to kind of back up the drive towards subnational um, smart specialization. So some of her findings looked at, you know, Ireland's approach to RNI um, is strongly Dublin centered. The governance structure limits the likes of the supply side and particularly the, I suppose, the convergence of industry and private sector. And, and most interestingly, the review referred to Ireland's smart specialization strategy as place blind. So that's an interesting term that we, we would have used because um, so, we, we have now, in, in the region itself, we, we, 
we, our colleague from Nord Regio was speaking at the conference earlier on, and we used their template that they conducted back in 2018 to commence a dialogue regionally with all of the, I suppose, quadruple helix stakeholders in the region to develop the first smart specialization strategy. And our, our approach to that is going to replicate the Nord Regio approach back in 2018. So we've commissioned a dialogue piece with Alison Hunter. So Alison Hunter is going to help to come in here and work with all the regional stakeholders on the first phase to develop a discussion paper on smart specialization. So how do we integrate the systems and the structures nationally with piloting a smart specialization strategy in Ireland um, between, 20, between, 20, 20, sorry, between 2020 and 2022? So that's the first, the first phase of that. It's going to focus on elements like obviously ICT, health and well-being, food, energy, climate, um, climate adaptation and sustainability, um, manufacturing, particularly in advanced and smart manufacturing, and then innovation in the business services and build on the kind of existing networks that we have here in the likes of the kind of precision um, engineering area, looking at wireless technologies that we have up in, up in um, Letterkenny, Donegal, Letterkenny, Shaban. Um, and, and, and that's, I suppose, our experience in the MPA. So our, the members, our elected members' ability to be able to take a leap into the space of much more aggressive subnational smart specialization, not waiting for national governments to be able to, to gift, I suppose, the pursuit of smart specialization was leaned on by our colleagues in Scotland and our, and our colleagues in Nord Regio. So without those linkages, without that understanding of how they're applied across Northern Periphery area, and I suppose the, the support of the European Commission, they, they wouldn't have happened. So I think what I wanted to do today was to share our, our experience of smart specialization, share some of the frustrations that we had at a regional level, but also, I suppose, look towards how we are going to apply it in the next two to four years um, in developing our own smart regional specialization strategy. So, uh, Leslie, I'll, I'll, I'll finish there. And look, I'm happy to take maybe any questions at the end. Great, thanks very much, David. Um, I think if we just go straight to Hilary now for your presentation, and then we'll kind of have a little discussion um, about some of the themes uh, there and then take some questions, if that's okay. Thank you very much, Leslie. Good afternoon from slightly sunny Brussels. I'll just share my screen that we get right on with my presentation. Yes, do you see the first slide? I'm, I'm going to be telling a, a bit about East and North Finland in industrial transition, which is kind of our core for our smart specialization strategy. And then I'm, I'm pinpointing a few things for the implementation from one of the regions, which was supposed to be here today. It's Lapland and I've been working with them in smart specialization implementation past five years. Now I'm running this East and North Finland wide project. Uh, 2018 we started from this point. You see a bit of about the uh, business structure and, and the livelihoods we have. So very heavily industry, industry related uh, business going on in the region, forestry, mining, and, and metallurgy especially, and then we have a big growth potential in, in computers, electronic and optical devices side. And, and then we ha you see on the right the education research basis where we work with as stakeholders uh, in particular in this project at the moment. Uh, and based on those things, what I mentioned briefly before, we mapped and went through all the seven smart specialization strategies in 2018. My colleague from Regional Council of Lebanon was leading the work and everybody listed their interests and on the development and, and let's say the current situation and also updating the smart specialization and this was merged to this picture which, which is a core of East and North Finland a smart specialization and an in industrial transition process. We've been working now a bit more, more than two years now, and it is funded by DG Regio, partly. So there are 12 regions in the EU, or more, or more detailed, two countries, and, and 10 regions on not two level who are working on this kind of initiative at the moment. And we just finished our pilot exercise uh, by the end of the summer, summer month, June. Anyway, uh, we found 
that we are all interested about linked clean technologies and low carbon solutions for industry, which also includes the industrial circular economy and as, as, a, as a spearhead for, for our strategy. And, and we can't forget the ICT and digitalization and other innovative technologies and production processes from the industry side. So this is the core and, and our so-called common competencies we look look also beyond our borders in East and North Finland and also cross-national cooperation, transnational cooperation and interregional cooperation. And in addition to that, we map the growth sectors where we have chemical industry, sustainable mining, bioeconomy and new products, manufacturing industry, sustainable tourism and appeal. And as David mentioned, we have the Santa Claus there, which is one of the key factors of, of success, success of our tourism in, in Northern Finland. Uh, and how we would like how we support and how we implement these strategies like we we build on our innovation platforms which are many times placed in the intermediary organizations uh, such as university of applied sciences development organizations and national research institutes and academia which is based in east and north finland then we also support the education side and and especially the training side for, for the industry and business and then we also want to include the financing side and and the local and regional and national and, and european funding authorities to dis discuss and to make make better strategy and implementation for it then we go a bit to the practice this picture represents the cluster policy of lapland which is very similar in east and north finland in the project i'm i'm leading at the moment i would like to point out the numbers two and four from the perspective of the interregional and transnational cooperation which is I'm just going to ask you one question. It's from Jarl in Um, How do we prepare for and possibly reduce unexpected critical effects of climate change? So how do we prepare for and try to reduce unexpected critical effects of climate change? It's a, it's a very large question. We have done some um, studies together with our students here. detailed approach from Lapland, they updated their smart specialization strategy, which was one of the forerunners, I would say, for a couple of years back, back in 2015, 16, 17. And now it's been recently updated and, and there is strong sustainability approach of obviously this time. And, and I'd like to point out the uh, track and link to the local green deal which is also taking place as a taking place as an implementation plan of this this triangle and and this means that they've linked the plan uh to united nations sdgs at least seven of them is mentioned in the local implementation plan and then that also includes currently the COVID response and then the exit strategy for for current situation being very important thing on the table, especially the tourism in industry is suffering a lot at the moment in Lapland. We are we are in the risk of losing 10,000 jobs if the next season won't happen as it should be, and, and the Santa Claus won't be happy either. I think that's me. Here you see my my contact, my colleagues who's taking care of our communication. Uh, please follow us on Twitter. You can see more on our web pages about the clusters and East and North Finland. Uh, I'm happy to re reply any questions. Thanks a lot. Great, thanks very much, Hilary. Um, thanks both for those presentations. Um, so I guess maybe I'll just ask a couple of questions uh, just to get us started, and then we'll go to the audience um, and take some questions there. So we start to think about any questions you might have and get ready to raise your virtual hand. Um, so leading on from some of the themes that you mentioned um, in those presentations, um, maybe I'd like to first kind of talk about how we use cooperation um, to address maybe some of the challenges that you're facing in your areas. Um, so David, you mentioned that um, maybe Ireland is a little bit further behind in terms of sharing and making the most of that cooperation um, and not tending to look north so much and the NPA has actually been the driver for that. 
Um, so, you know, are there any areas where you think you could develop that? Um, and maybe what do you think has kind of hindered your, pro your progress so far? Thanks, Leslie. Nice, nice, easy one to start. I, I, I look. I, I, I think Ireland is um, Ireland. Ireland is in the process of applying for a seat with the Arctic Council, and I'm looking towards Brendan here on my screen. I think I'm correct in in that. It, it is. It is. It is also looking. It's at a draft stage of developing an Arctic strategy for engagement. Um, uh, so I think all, all of those. All of those, I suppose, approaches will help Ireland in its, I suppose, pivoting towards, I suppose, further cooperation in the northern periphery and Arctic. Um, I, I think our natural, our natural home, when you look at these cooperation um, initiatives, you know, from from, okay, from a northern western regional perspective, we're sitting on the, the furthermost point in the Atlantic Ocean, but a, a lot of our shared challenges, um, some of our shared it, I suppose industrial challenges. Um, we would lean much towards some of the peripheral um, rural regions within the MPA. So there's a natural innovation linkages, particularly within our third level sectors, much more towards the MPA. And we spent a lot of time over the last two, two to three years, and particularly particularly Brendan's work um, in building the connections that we have and, and the foundations we have, particularly our third level sectors and our innovation actors in the region. Um, with the MPA program, and I think if you, if you look at I suppose some of the projects that have been approved, um, al al albeit they're, they're, they reflect the I suppose the, the individual organisation success in accessing the funds and participating, but I think you know Bre Brendan and the work of the of, of the region in trying to pivot uh, I suppose much of our local and regional stakeholders into the MPA program, um, because of the level of innovation has 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 been critical. So um, for us, I think Ireland, the member state, is seeing. A much more, I suppose, in, in pursuit of improving levels of innovation, I think, you know, we, we're looking much more towards the, our, our Arctic cousins um, because we have, a, I suppose, more of a natural culture um, around business, uh, business community, the way we approach our, ru our rural communities, city-led re city regional development. So a lot of our systems are actually quite aligned. And what, what we're actually, and, and, and that has allowed us as a region, I suppose, to be able to accelerate a lot of our planning um, in, in only this year in 2020, we developed our first regional spatial economic strategy. A, a, lot, a, lot, of the, a lot of the approach in that would have, would have been driven by the Danish model again, because you know often Ireland is referred to as a small country by our own policy people, but actually Denmark is 60% the size of Ireland, but has a much more aggressive pursuit of regional economic development and regional smart specialization. So, if the Danes can do it, we can do it. Um, and that's kind of been where we've been up to. So look, I think there's, a, there's an awful lot where we can lean on. Um, and, and for us, I think we'll, we'll be looking much more north in the, in, in, over the next 10 years. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, apologies, that was maybe a bit of a, uh, a strong start there. Um, and then I guess for both of you, um, in terms of regional strategies, um, where do you kind of see the transnational cooperation projects contributing to your region strategy? How can they kind of contribute to your vision and your plans for the future going forward? Larry, maybe you might want to explain that. Yes, I can start. Thanks Thanks a lot, Leslie. Uh, uh, I think whole, Oost, whole East and North Finland has always been thinking that internationalization and, and, and working with others outside the region is, is a key thing because we are not so many people to spot it past population and everything around that, all the all the con conditions we have similar in, in all the rest of the NPA area is, is very important. And, and especially Lapland, they, they often say that they're the most most international region in, in Finland because of a uh, country, country border with three countries. And so I think it's always been core of the smart specialization. And if I track down back five years, we started to work with clusters 2015 in Lapland and, and soon after we started to go abroad. So we found new partners in interregional cooperation in Spain in, in important topics like mining, forestry. And that same thing goes on in other East and North Finland region. And we've been continuing that work right now. For example, we found a new partner for uh, Kajani, which is growing as a high performance computing center all, all already in the European scale. So 
these kind of topics are important and we're always ready for new kind of cooperation. And we've been successful with the with Horizons and Interact Europe project as well. So this is this has always been the approach and will be. We see a lot of value with it. Yeah, look, and, and, and look from, from our perspective, this is the, the, the first time in the history of Ireland we have a regional spatial and economic strategy that was published in 2020. So everything up until this stage had been, I suppose, either a national policy or was a place-based response to particular local challenges. Um, we've been delivering European funds into the regions since 1999. And I suppose, you know, albeit that, that, that money has been invested wisely, it, it wasn't targeted at regionally specific objectives. So we're in a very fortunate position that the regional strategy has been published in 2020. It's aligned with our political cycles here in Ireland. So we have now have a corporate plan. We have a regional, spatial and economic strategy that is completely and utterly focused on a smarter and greener agenda uh, up until 2024. Uh, and obviously that aligns very neatly with both the um, European Commission agenda, um, but also the emerging policies under the Northern Periphery and Arctic. And, you know, we've been very fortunate that there's been a very open dialogue and consultation in relation to the next round of the MPA. So we've been able to engage um, with, with our MPA partners um, on the development of the program. But that conversation is also fed into our own instruments and our own policy objectives. So we're already looking now at, I suppose, building a network of kind of aligned partners in regions and cities across the MPA that might be able to cooperate on kind of areas of specialization over the next four or five years as opposed to maybe what traditionally would have happened here which would have been I suppose um, reactive responses to maybe some calls and looking for partnerships whereas now we want to look at you know where are similar regions having similar problems or similar opportunities that need to be explored and you know conferences like today are hugely beneficial for us to be able to do that and, 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 and engage so um, before Brendan says it, we're, 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 and he never misses an opportunity to sell, we're, we're very much open for business um, in, in, in any of the future, future calls um, in, in areas of priority. So that, that's kind of where we see, and of course, we're, we, we avail of all, all of the funding instruments across the European Commission. We're very much involved in Interreg Europe. We're obviously a main stakeholder in Atlantic area, Interreg Europe, Horizon 2020, um, and all of these are now tailored around the regional strategy. Great. Um, and kind of Following on from that then, um, are there any kind of lessons that you've learned over kind of the last few years um, in terms of the implementation of your strategy, any kind of success stories in terms of cooperation um, that you can think of that you'd maybe build on or kind of um, take forward kind of in the future? I, 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 I might lean on, I, I'm going to, I suppose, one of the one of the big challenges we had here in the region was, 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 was one, sometimes European funding programs, because of, well, particularly in Ireland, because our, we, we, we've, we haven't developed the capacity of our, I suppose, education sector, our local authority sector to be able to access and participate um, in European programs as much as we, we would like, because we see significant opportunities in, in all of these programs. And we, our, our Irish partners don't tend to be off the scale to lead a lot of these programs. So we've done a bit of analysis and done a lot of research on, I suppose, who are the primary players in the last round and who do we work with to see if we can elevate their capacity into being real drivers um, of change. But one, one, one thing that we did um, in 2018, or, and again, Brendan led out on this from our point of view was, we, we built a kind of a, a capacity building instrument around education. So we developed a kind of a diploma in EU funding. And that essentially was a, Essentially, we, we, kidnapped, we kidnapped groups of 20 people from the region and we took them away for kind of three days of intensive military, military type uh, training to Brussels and various other different um, and experiences. We exposed them, I suppose, to, to other um, leaders in these programs. And it, over a three day period, you know, we educated people on the EU institutions, the way the policy evolves, how, we, how our organizations and our agencies can, I suppose, you know, start to understand the policy machine in Europe and where the opportunities in, in the, across the MFF life cycle exist. You know, so that organizations like ourselves are not reactive. You know, we're positioning ourselves now as a smarter and a greener space because that's where we see, obviously, the European agenda. You know, for us, 
the, the European machine works in, in, in 2013, Ireland had a 13% unemployment rate. That was, that was, that was you know, nearly eight years ago. Europe adopted a growth strategy and seven years later, pre-COVID, Ireland had a 4.5% unemployment rate. So the message here is that you know, we celebrate both identities, we celebrate all of our partnerships, and if we work together, we can do more and we can be more innovative. And to, I suppose to, to lean on the quote earlier on, which I enjoyed in the conference, was that the, those who learn the fastest are, are, will, will, be, will be the most successful. So we're, we're, we're at a regional level, we're trying to be that incubation space for good ideas and good policy development. Um, and look, that for us, the, the, the NPA is the space that provides a lot of that. Great. Uh, Hilary, if you'd like to come in as well. Yes, thanks. I actually, I can't, I can't agree more with what David said, but it is exactly as he said, that the training and the groundwork and the learning, learning about the policy and the background that needs to be done on and that you need to be visible and active here in Brussels, for it, for instance, and, and then everything has to be built on your own limited vision, vision because at least for us, the resources are limited, so we can't do the work on every specific policy field and, and find out, but we need to really focus on the key, key spearheads of our strategy and, and put that in action and also build the long, long, long term game. And, and I have a good example about the Horizon project, which we won in Lapland 2017 and the work started 2015. So we worked together with the partners and we always came together with European partners. It was not just Lapland going going and pushing their own agenda, but we had at least three to five partners already in the first time when we met commission that this kind of thing in the regional policy is important for mining regions. And then this was in, in, in the end, uh, as it, this resulted as a successful uh, coordination and support action from Horizon projects for mining policy and mining regional, regional policy. And of course, use, uh, use the help you have. I mean, we have European office here, which is representing us. Our stakeholders are used to work with them, but more you have, let's say, collective uh, and, and more ambitious uh, initiatives also together with the office, it, it, it gets you get better results. And, and if you talk about the SMEs, which are in the end, the end beneficiaries who build, and, uh, who build the business and, and where the growth is happening, we need to have the tr trust with them to get them on board on the European initiatives. And, and there are only few people who can do it in the region in, in the end. So they are there every day and, and they meet the entrepreneurs. So we need to engage them and help, help give a helping hand for them and find some facilitation support for cluster kind of work and, and support for the business environment and so on. Great, thank you. Um... And I'll ask maybe one last question before we go on to uh, audience questions. I can tell we already have a couple. Um, just looking at the way forward and kind of towards um, MPA 2021-27, um, you both kind of mentioned the changes and the evolution of how you've addressed issues um, over the last few years. Um, so what are you looking towards in your areas um, for this next program session in terms of new opportunities for cooperation or just kind of any of your big priorities uh, maybe i could start this time yep. thanks uh, i remember when i was working working in an npp project uh six seven years ago when we were building the current program and i missed that the topics were still very important in the previous one but i i can't can't say that they are not anymore so those same topics sustainability on energy perspective, energy efficiency, those are things. And, and then also certain kind of social inclusion building the, on building on the cultural heritage in the Northern periphery. They are very, very important for, for us in Eastern North Finland still. And maybe we can add a term called social economy, which is also getting more foothold in the European perspective. Also in the industrial policy, there is, there is more and more things coming on social end of, enterprises and social economy. So this is one of the key factors we should follow. And, and you can't forget the SDGs coming from the United Nations, which is also building a bridge with, between global policy, uh, European policy and local policy in the region. So those are things we look forward, apart from the most important, which is the industrial policy for us. So this Great. Is our um, great. Uh, and David, if you have any any thoughts on that? Yeah, Leslie, I don't have anything to majorly add to, to what Hilary says. I think from our perspective, um, I think, you know, the transition to a low carbon economy is particularly for, from an economic perspective, we're looking at huge, huge areas of opportunity and, you know, we'd be 
encouraging all of our um, uh, territorial programs to, to, to look at, I suppose, stimulating much higher levels of uh, innovation um, and challenging, I suppose, make, making sure as part of the program management that you know, we're stimulating the kind of convergence of national, regional, local stakeholders in, in, in the projects to, so we can make sure that, the, I suppose, the diffusion of learning is happening much more, much quicker um, uh, and is much more disruptive because there's some hugely innovative practices that are going on, particularly within the Irish system. Again, I'm, I'm leaning on the likes of the, 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 the you know, some, some, some of the key stakeholders in the NPA program, again, the likes of the Airnax. You know, how do we diffuse the learnings from these local practices, particularly in economies where, and, and public policy spaces where there's a disconnect between the national and the local. Um, you know, we've got huge innovation, innovation going on at a national level and it's mirrored at a local level, you know, but how do we make sure there's that diffusion of, 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 of knowledge and innovation? Um, because it, for, for you know, we we looked at examples, um, uh, you know, like the 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 I'm forgetting the name of the Finnish rural approach of the uh, micro specialization, is it in rural areas? You know, examples like that that can be applied much more quicker um, uh, across the MPA program. So th those learnings need to be need to be diffused much quicker. Um, that's certainly part of our I suppose our submissions to a lot of the, the ETC programs. For the MPA program, you know, and, and a, a continued focus on smart specialization, particularly in the space that we're in, and, and also the institutional capacity piece to make sure, you know, that our stakeholders in, in maybe smaller scale, and particularly more rural and peripheral areas who are as equally as innovative as the larger industries are not being left behind because of an inability to be able to participate in the programs or to, or to I suppose, to um, deliver on their ambitions because of not having the capacities and resources so look that's that's critical for us and I know, I know the MPA partners are looking at all those elements um, and, and will suitably respond. Great thanks very much thanks very much to both of you um, for taking my first questions um, so we'll now go to the audience um, I think we already have uh, a first question from Brendan um, so Brendan if you'd like to go ahead. Thanks Leslie um, and thanks David and Hilary. Uh, I'm going to be tasked in about 10 or 15 minutes to go back into a plenary and, and summarize um, what we just discussed over the last half hour. But one question I have for, for both of you is, if you were asked to define what sparse specialization is in one sentence, what would you say? My 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 um, my thing is off, and I think Hillary is pretending that his uh, his microphone is off, so he can pause and think about that one. Um, thanks, thanks, Brendan, for that. Uh, <laughs> your your annual annual leave is cancelled next week. Um, look, look, smart specialization for me in one in one line. Smart specialization is has been in existence from community led local development back twenty years ago. It's it's a policy instrument that's been used. Um, however, there has not been, I suppose, a consistent application of it. So in one line is, I suppose, a, a smart specialization is a technical expert way of transferring knowledge and creating job growth in local, local economies and local communities. I don't think you can actually answer it in one line, but I, I, can, I, can, give a par I can give a paragraph on it. That's actually not the first time I've been asked, and I can't remember what I replied two years ago in Sweden when I was posed with the same question. But I think is a is a tool to build build on your strengths in, in a regional policy work. So this this is what I see how I see it, and and this tool can be meaning various things depends on who's talking. Of course, it's much more harder to understand from perspective of SMEs because the chain chain between is a bit longer, but. But for, for policymakers like us or the people people working in the project, it's something like you can you can focus your resources. It's easier because you have always you have limited resources. So you take the topic. I work on this topic. This is important for us, and let's let's full, go full speed on. So this this is a tool for me. It's, I, th I think it's it's probably a, it's a really interesting debate, and it's it's probably something that has come up in Ireland recently because. Uh, under our enterprise policy, I, I, you know, there's been a reluctance to look at things sub-nationally. So within our enterprise policy at a national level, there's a great chapter that's referred to as place-based development. 
and place-based development is, is for me a very kind of light reference to maybe what's been going on in maybe some of the lagging countries in the last 10 or 15 years. You know, it's, it, I think Hillary's correct. I think, it, you know, it, smart specialization is about focusing on local strengths, but it's the, the easy, probably the easy element of that is identifying the strengths but I think the systems and the structural reform that's required to support those local institutions and regional institutions to converge and make sure that the policy, the funding, and the, there's no fragmentation of effort is probably more critical than identifying the, the key strengths because I think the key strengths is nearly the, the, the bit you nearly need to work, work back from. Um, so it, the, the difficult bit becomes the systems analysis and the structural analysis that's required to make sure that that convergence, that dialogue, um, happens and I think that's probably in, in Ireland where we're, we're hopefully going to be looking at over the next four or five years. Great um, and we'll take the next question which is from uh, Jose Manuel San Emeterio. Yeah, hello good afternoon everybody uh, actually my, my question goes very in line with what David was commenting and my question is in particular to David. Uh, as you were saying, in, in Ireland, for the period 2014-2020, the, the smart specialization strategy was a nice level. So, in my opinion, that didn't reflect very well the, the particularities of each of the regions. And I completely agree with you. It's for the next programming period, because I think now the, the, the regions are in the process of, of reviewing the smart specializations. Is there a bigger role for the regions in order to capture all that particularities, all that local-based initiatives? Is, is, is it going to be a bigger role, for example, I don't know if it's going to be the Northwest Regional Assembly or other regional actors in, the, in shaping the, the new smart specialization strategy for, for the new programming period? Uh, yeah, th thanks, Jose Manuel. Um, yes, the, the, I, I think to try and attempt to, to answer that is that uh, the structure of the next round of funds is currently being um, negotiated um, and, and the design and the architecture on those funds as a kind of a leverage on smart specialization. We, I just don't know the answer to that yet for the period of 21-27. Uh, I, I expect to, we, we'd expect to know, know what that's going to look like maybe in the next, in the next two to three months. I, I think the, the big issue you flag there is the, the evidence collection around smart specialization and the strategies. So I think even if we detach structural funds because particularly in Ireland we've used structural funds as, as a tool to lean on as our kind of instrument around regional development. We, we now have a policy uh, wing and an instrument in, in the regional assemblies and the regional spatial economic strategies so I, I suppose most importantly we need to develop the policy because the funding will follow the policy um, and you know w w in, in the review that was conducted earlier on this year by Alice Hunter that I mentioned in my presentation, Smart Specialization Ireland, you know, it was a really excellent report. It was done in a very quick time frame. It, it captures, you know, huge strengths that are, that are ongoing in Ireland that have, I suppose, put us into the position that I mentioned there around the, I suppose, some of our, 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 our global rankings are quite high in some of the spaces, but there, but the spatial distribution of that success has been very uneven and is largely concentrated in the, in, in largely in Dublin and in Cork. Um, and, and I suppose that has resulted in one, one of the regions again, I suppose, be, becoming increasingly un, uncompetitive. So the, the, the review that was done by, uh, by Alison Hunter certainly looked at how do we capture evidence in relation to cluster based policy? You know, how do we incorporate clusters in our smart specialization strategy? Where are the clusters? How many do they employ? What are their growth um, potentials? And, and that evidence just hasn't been collected to date. There, there are, I suppose, it, financial instruments to try and, I suppose, identify some of those clusters, but again, they're place-based responses. They're relying on local industry to come together to, um, to, I suppose, allocate private sector resources to be able to help public policy development. And, and that's just, we, we need to get to a space where the national, the local, regional, and the private and industry players are cooperating in a way where there's a joint benefit coming from all of us. And I think that's where, uh, Jose Manuel, I suppose, irrespective of structural funds, I think that's probably where the policy space is going to go to. And, and with that, I would hope funding either from National Exchequer or through um, structural funds and the likes of ETC. Thank you, David. Wait, do we have... 
Oh, maybe yeah. I can add a few, few words on that. Uh, yeah. I would like to point out two terms, uh, entrepreneurial discovery process, and then also the monitoring of the smart specialization. I think these things are something we're going to build on in the future. And, and at least in Finland, we've been rather lazy this programming period really monitor and, and and look after the impact what we gain through smart specialization and i've seen already some positive indicators on the direction from the commission side and and also from national ministry in finland who that we will get more more push to that, that direction and we actually trying to start our work in east and north finland also for a new kind of monitoring cooperation and, and discussing what's going on in that's three levels and maybe implement something on that's two level as well in the future so it's very important to show the stakeholders especially companies that there is a real impact on this work so this is, we need those key performance indicators and, and and look for after real results from the field great um and i think we have another question from danny o'toole how you doing folks uh, question for david how you doing um in your slide you obviously showed the obvious disparity in investment in the different sectors in the region um obviously mpa and similar programs will have a a critical part to play in re-energizing those sectors uh, where do you see the priorities lying and secondly to your point on the the capacity of local authorities to be able to deliver and participate in the much larger projects. I do agree with that. I think we are probably under under resource, under capacity, and, and any help or advice or suggestions that you can give us in that space would be welcomed because I think um, there's lots of opportunities here for, for us going forward. Uh, yeah, th th thanks, Danny. I, I, I suppose um, I, I'm conscious not everybody on the call will be or on the on the on, in the conference is familiar with I suppose the Irish system. So I'll keep it brief. I suppose as part of our new corporate plan, um, within at a regional level, there's three regions in Ireland. Within our particular region, we have nine local authorities, um, eight counties, and one city, um, and the city authority and, and county authorities. And I suppose th it, there's always been a challenge in in their capacity to be able to access some of these EU funds. So, some of them have been excellent, um, and then some of them have a ch had challenges due to resource implications. As part of our new corporate plan, and I suppose this will maybe of interest, Danny, to the likes of yourself and Mayo, um, you know, the NWA will be working or will be attempting to work with each local authority to develop an EU strategy. So we've already started that conversation with each of the nine local authorities um, in, in, in to be, try and be consistent with the emerging priorities in both the likes of the MPA, AA, Interreg Europe, uh, Atlantic Area, um, so that we can start to develop year strategy and year concentration of priorities. Um, in, in, in accessing, I suppose, those, those funds, um, those cooperations, but I suppose most importantly, the, the knowledge transfer that we can get from participating in the, um, in the programs. Tr traditionally, uh, European funds and particularly territorial funds would have been seen nearly as a way to access funding. And in the, in the last five or six years, what we've found really is, is a radical change here. It's, it's the knowledge that partners are accessing and cooperating on and the level of innovation that's happening um, because of that. So, the, the, the funding is only a vehicle to be able to access all those funds and, and that's been something you know so we, we'll be concentrating on those over the next um, over the next couple of years for us I suppose the concentration for us is, is going to be on our key identified sectors within our regional strategy again as I said yet you know the likes of within ICT looking at future networks looking at IOT data analytics management you know areas of your expertise that you're doing there in Mayo um, again looking at the four other headings around health and well-being particularly medical devices um, sector in Galway, food, looking at productivity, the pro processing of food, particularly in line with the SDGs, and then looking at, you know, obviously the low carbon transition, looking at energy, climate, uh, climate action, sustainability, particularly decarb decarbonization, and then, you know, some of the real key regional strengths that we'll hopefully be able to, act, you know, encourage, um, I suppose, stimulate innovation more than encourage it, but stimulate it to using the likes of the MPA around particularly in the manufacturing, advanced manufacturing and smart manufacturing and, and leaning on the likes of um, our institutions and the likes of Letterkenny who are looking, you know, the likes of the WiseR lab there who are looking at wireless solutions and then innovation and business services. And there are key sectors that, so if I can give you a very quick example, in the last round of these ETC programs, you know, they're, they're, you know the, the, the policy formulation would have, 
would have would have been much stronger at, at a national level, uh, and the expertise lied there as well. I suppose we're fortunate now that we ha we're in a position that th that the region has a voice in being able to direct the future programs, or sorry, contribute to the direction of the programs um, in, in a way that we haven't had before. So we can tailor our submissions, particularly into the area based needs analysis and the, and the wider consultation to make sure that our stakeholders priorities are consistent with the likes of the MPA Atlantic area, Interreg Europe, and we make sure that, that there's a consistency of policy there. So but hopefully our work will create opportunities for your work and, and the type of stuff that you're doing in, 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 in Mayo. And that's a long, a long story short, or a short story long. I can't remember. Great. Um, do we have any other questions from people? Nobody has raised their hands. Would anyone like to raise their hands? If not, I'll ask a question. Um, if I can, um, perhaps for Hillary. Um, David kind of mentioned um, the kind of national, subnational, um, local aspect of engagement. Um, and in your Eastern and Northern Finland strategy, it mentions that the regional councils are the kind of guide to operators for looking for collaboration opportunities. So just kind of how effective is that um, in terms of sharing the regional experiences and is there a multi-level uh, element to that? Yes, for sure. We, we are not playing there alone and, and we are nothing without our stakeholders in the region. So we need to know them enough well and we also need to stick with our role. So we, we don't engage directly with companies. It will be other people doing that, but we need to engage with the people who work directly with the company. So that builds a three level approach already. And then we also need to clear our, our roles, who's playing the local game and who's playing the European game, because you can't go both ways on that either. So. So there are also directions and, and of course there are other approaches than EU and local as well. You can do the cross border and there are more, lots of ETCs in East and North Finland which can be access, accessed for many of our stakeholders. And then there is this big international global play which, which you can act, access through the EU or, or on your own. So these multiple ways and levels are, it's a combination and, and, and I think smart specialization and, and these projects supporting, they really help you find your role and, and, and see where you're good at and who, who, is, who is best in what role. So this is all, all, all very important to understand the big picture. Great, thank you. Um, so we've now got just a couple of minutes left. Um, I want to just make sure we have a minute or two just to give ourselves a quick break uh, before we go back to the uh, plenary session. So um, if I could just ask um, Hilary and David just for one or two sentences of their closing thoughts, um, just kind of what you've taken away from either this session just now or the conference as a whole. Um, so we'll go to David first. Thanks, Leslie. Um, look, I, I, I think first and foremost, I think probably what I've taken from is, um, particularly Ilri's presentation there around their, their, their cohesive approach to smart specialization. And I suppose I, 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 if, if you'll facilitate, I might have a couple of direct questions by email um, after this conference, because I'd, like I'd like to talk to more about their, their, their regional focus and, 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 and their structures. Um, so look, what, what I've taken away there is, I suppose, the, the very clear, coherent approach to their smart specialization. You know, they're focused on very clear industries, very clear sectors. Um, and, and I think it, it probably articulates very clearly to me, I suppose, what smart specialization is in that it's, a very, it's, it's you know, as I said at the outset, identifying, you know, local strengths is probably the easy element. It's the structure, it's the policy work around it, it's the systems reimagination re 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 that's required to be able to deliver it um, and, 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 and to be able to measure it as well. So. I think from our perspective, I think we are certainly be looking at, 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 at those types of models and, and hopefully in a couple of years we'll be back here being able to demonstrate that we have, I suppose, a smart specialization, clear smart specialization strategy, but also that we have, uh, I suppose, it resourced as well with a very clear focus and a partnership across industry, our third level sector and national agencies. So um, I, I'll be taking that away from today and thanks to Hillary for his presentation. Great, and Hilary? Thank you, David. We'll definitely be in contact on that side. And, and I must say that your approach with the 
building the picture with the current structure and, and logistics and the transport se sector, it's not so visible, at least in East and North Finland. Uh, maybe in some, some certain regions below that, but may, maybe we should also learn from that and, and build kind of whole picture in East and North Finland, how, how these things limit, because we have great differences among, among our regions. All the region is really big compared to any other region in East and, fin East and North Finland. And, there are lots of challenges in, in transport and logistics and, and there's always internal competition for example the harbors in Lapland and Oulu they're always competing who gets access to the Cup of Botnia and what kind of things going on there so your approach with the current let's say the really good update what's going on on that side as well would be an ad ad added value for us so I, I like that part a lot and and what else I, I wanted to say I also like that you, you've been using Alice Hunter I've been working with him with her as well a couple of times and, and I think they're always on the ball with the smart specialization and then she's she's very well following the European play on that side so that good that's good news and then we've learned from her too I don't know otherwise th thanks a lot for inviting me and, and I'm, we will keep in contact with David great well thanks very much to both of you um, for your time today um, if we were in person, there would be a round of applause, but um, perhaps a virtual uh, applause for you just now. Um, thanks everybody for joining and everyone who had a question um, and I'll let you all go 